Buonasera a tutti, benvenuti alla Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimo. Um, welcome to the Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimo. It's a pleasure to see you all this evening. Um, I think the turnout is testament to the extraordinary power of Elena Ferrante's work, the excitement we share in attending to the advent of the Neapolitan novels, which were published one per year beginning in 2011 and 2012 in English. Um, I've taken to calling the tetralogy the Liliad, and I'm trying to make it catch on. Um, after the character Lilla, whose disappearance without a trace begins my brilliant friend, prompting the narrator's flood of memories and sprawling account. The Liliad seems appropriate to me because of the text's dense tapestry of classical themes, some of which we'll hear about this evening. The ruin of Naples, and of Italy, and of woman, um, is not unlike the devastation of Ilium at the wrathful hands of butchers like Achille, Achilles and Agamemnon. Marcello and Michele Solara perform not in the fickle theater of Mount Olympus, but that of Monte Citorio. The success of the Liliad cannot be attributed to the strategic marketing of her enigmatic identity or to the fetishization of Italianita, but to the dazzling emergence of a truly new Italian epic. To elaborate on the words of Alexander Pope, if Homer made us hearers and Virgil left us readers, Ferrante has aroused our fervors or maybe raised our fevers. As the story of the lost child spirals towards its concluding cycle of waste and renewal, uh, mapped onto the Neapolitan urbe, the novel's villains become victims to the power they thought they moved. The killings are described as events without cause, two bodies fall, bloodying the church steps. Uh, um, children become agitated. Origin recedes into a timeless cycle of violence and destruction, one that may begin with unification or with fascism or with the liberation experienced in Naples as a plague. Or perhaps the origin is more ancient still. Perhaps it can be traced back to Troy or to the stories of Diotima or Penelope or Cassandra who Krista Wolf writes is one of the first women to suffer the fate that has been shared with women since, that of being turned into an object. We're indeed fortunate to bear witness to the Ferrante phenomenon, and more importantly, to be readers of her work, the Liliad, the Novelle, the children's story, the beach at night, her short essays in The Guardian, and the essays, letters, and interviews collected in La Frantumalia. We're also fortunate to attend to this momentous literary event guided by a scholar as brilliant as our speaker this evening. Stiliana Milkova is an assistant professor of comparative literature at Oberlin College. She holds a PhD in comparative literature from the University of California, Berkeley, and a bachelor's degree from Brown University. Her first essay on Ferrante, Mothers, Daughters, Dolls, on Disgust in the Lost Daughter, published in 2013, puts the novella into dialogue with La Frantumalia and with theories of disgust. Her analysis shows how the text uses disgusting, the category of disgusting, to problematize motherhood and daughterhood as normative, transparent categories. Since that brilliant essay, she's published no fewer than five academic articles on Ferrante, offering, for example, incisive analysis of the Neapolitan writer's use of ekphrasis and visual poetics, um, the Translator's Visibility, uh, and the Gender Spaces of Turin in the Days of Abandonment. You may assume, given this remarkable body of scholarship, that Stiliana is primarily a scholar of Ferrante, but her interests extend well beyond the margins of Ferrante's pages. She also works on Russian and Bulgarian literature, literature in the visual arts, literature in architecture, travel writing, and literary translation. She has published on Ekphrasis in Gogol, Tolstoy, and Dostoevsky, on Gogol's Grand Tour, on the Bulgarian writer Konstantin Vyachkov, um, Velichkov, and on Russian symbolist erotic poetry, and on Soviet literature. Um, she's also curated two exhibitions at the Allen Memorial Art Museum um, with the titles Italy on Paper and On the Threshold. 
Finally, she is the managing editor of the blog Reading in Translation and a prolific literary translator. She's translated from Italian uh, works by Antonio Tabucchi, Alessandro Barico, Anita Raya, Andrea Raus, and Dario Voltolini. I had the pleasure of co-translating with her an essay on translation by Anita Raya, a translator from German into Italian. Stiliana, um, already an accomplished translator, was a luminous mentor to me in that process, and she deserves sole credit for the most difficult part of the essay, which was the translation of Raya's translation of Ingeborg Bachmann's Bohemia Lies by the Sea. So it's a true honor and privilege and delight to introduce her this evening. Um, her talk is titled Ariadne and the Minotaur, um, Symbolic and Literal Labyrinth in Elena Ferrante's My Brilliant Friend. Please join me in welcoming Stiliana Milkova. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you to the Casa Italiana. Can you hear me now? Uh, no. no. OK. Elena Ferrante's Neapolitan novels, the four volumes comprising the tetralogy My Brilliant Friend, unfold within an intensely mapped, identifiable, and traceable urban topography. The often hostile city of Naples assaults Ferrante's female characters, seeping, as it were, into their bodies, shaping their movements and their minds. In Ferrante's novels, as women negotiate city streets, they not only endure the weight of this male city, as Ferrante herself describes it, but also, as they walk, the streets themselves evoke memories of past violence and oppression at the hands of men. We see Delia in Elena Ferrante's first novel, Troubling Love, recall a history of molestation and domestic abuse as she traverses Naples. Olga, the protagonist of Ferrante's second novel, wanders compulsively through the city of Torino, only to find in it traces of her Neapolitan past, of betrayed and abandoned Neapolitan women. And in Ferrante's third novel, The Last Daughter, The Lost Daughter, excuse me, we follow Leda, who has escaped from Naples to Florence, as she's forced to come to terms with her Neapolitan roots and the traumas of her past. This, then, is the basic topographic structure of Ferrante's early novels. Her plots emerge from the act of remembering the past, and remembering transpires as her characters walk through the city and experience its sights. Streets and memory, urban space and text, cityscape and storytelling are thus intertwined in Ferrante's novels. But there is more to her poetics of topography the linking of urban architectural structures, buildings, courtyards, squares, staircases, cellars, balconies, tunnels, to symbolic structures of patriarchal violence and oppression. We see this architectonic foundation of her texts as early as Ferrante's first novel, but it gains visibility and full realization in her Neapolitan novels, where Naples functions as both a literal, urban, geographic, architectural setting, and as a symbolic foundation, the underworld, the magma of the novel's mythological and sociocultural imaginary. As such, the city in the tetralogy shapes the bodies and the psyches of the two protagonists, Elena and Lila. It frames and contains them within their violent, male-dominated, crime-ridden Neapolitan neighborhood. In my talk today, I will focus on the topography and architectural spaces of the first volume, My Brilliant Friend, as they map a labyrinth of sorts. This labyrinth is the literal labyrinth of the place where Lila and Elena live, trapped in the periphery, their neighborhood confined by a tunnel and train tracks on the south, and a state prison on the north. This labyrinth is the place where Lila and Elena live. Um, it is also the underworld of domestic violence and organized crime. It is an underworld governed by a patriarchal system in which women are punished for any transgression or desire. The labyrinth is also the archaic locus of the Minotaur, the man-beast of Greek mythology, the monster who terrifies Lila and Elena in My Brilliant Friend. But, as I will show today, taking you on a tour of Lila and Elena's childhood, the two girls enter the labyrinth and defeat the Minotaur, 
thereby reconfiguring both the literal and symbolic architectonics of their neighborhood. The four Neapolitan novels follow the lives of two friends, Elena and Lila, over a period of 60 years. The tetralogy is framed by a prologue in which the narrator, Elena Greco, a well-known writer, now 66 years old, finds out that her friend Lila has disappeared from Naples, erasing every trace of her existence. Elena decides to write the story of her friendship with Lila, that is to write Lila back into existence, to replace her absence with a textual presence. This narrative resurrection of Lila is ever more meaningful as Elena admits she has modeled her own writing on the writing of her friend who had never left Naples. Thus, to reconstruct Lila's life is also to reconstruct the place where they grew up, to rebuild space as storyteller, to use Laura Chiesa's phrase. The four novels then chart not only the history of Elena and Lila's friendship, but also the history of their unnamed Neapolitan neighborhood, the Rione, mapping the two girls' lives onto the topography of the Rione, of Naples, and then beyond. More specifically, my brilliant friend tracks Elena and Lila's movements through city streets, squares, and gateways, inside courtyards, buildings, and cellars, within tunnels, corridors, and staircases. This first volume creates the story of Lila and Elena's friendship, also is what Michel de Sertot conceives as a spatial story, that is, reading walking trajectories as texts, or is what I term Ferrante's poetics of topography. From the opening pages of My Brilliant Friend, Elena recounts her childhood as dominated by the spatial, social, and power hierarchies of the Rione. At the center of the universe is the former lone shark and black mark market dealer Don Achille. This is how Elena describes her, the fear he instills in the community. And I quote, we didn't know the origin of that fear, rancor, hatred, meekness that our parents displayed toward Don Achille and transmitted to us. But it was there. It was a fact like the neighborhood, its dirty white houses, the fetid odor of the landings, the dust of the streets. Notably, Elena depicts Don Achille through the grim architectural spaces of the Rione, its houses, landings, streets. He becomes an inextricable element of the architectonic and social fabric of the neighborhood, a note of power and terror that regulates not only the children's behavior, but also that of their parents and the whole neighborhood. In her seminal essay, Bodies, cities, Elizabeth Gross underscores the power of the city to regulate and organize human bodies. The built environment, urban architecture and topography, she argues, provide the physical context in which we internalize and then enact proper social, sexual, and political behavior. The city, that is, produces and circulates power. Don Achille's power, in Elena's words, pervades the physical dimensions of the Rione, its streets and houses, dictating obedience and silence. What is more, the Rione maps a topography of violence and suffering. The neighborhood's architectural spaces become the sites for scandals and aggressions, the stage where the fragility of the human body and the insignificance of human life are made visible. Elena describes the neighborhood as, quote, a world in which children and adults were often wounded. Blood flowed from the wounds, they festered, and sometimes people died. My mother's father had been killed when he fell from a scaffolding at a building site." End of quote. Lila and, Ellen, Lila and her classmate Enzo fight with rocks in the street until they're both bleeding. Lila's father throws her out of the window Melina Capuccio and Lydia Saratore attack each other viciously on the stairs. And Don Achille throws his enemy, Alfredo Peluso, against a tree in the public gardens. This is the world into which my brilliant friend plunges us from its very first pages. It's a world confined within the boundaries of the Rione and governed by forms of power manifested in the very topography of the place. As the central embodiment of power, Don Achille organizes Lila and Elena's conception of both space and time. It is not by chance that part one of the first volume is entitled Childhood, the story of Don Achille. Don Achille and his 
dark menacing building, structure the spatial configuration and plot development of the girl's childhood and the origins of their lifelong friendship. Don Aquiles' building acquires the physical and symbolic dimensions of a labyrinth with the terrifying man-eating monster at its center. In this labyrinth, recalling the Greek myth of Theseus and the Minotaur, creates the myth of origins of Lila and Elena's friendship. And as Grace Russo Bolaro has suggested, Don Achille is the fulcrum of Elena and Lila's understanding of time, of their notions of before and after he had revealed his monstrous nature. So let us trace the textual parameters and coordinates of Don Achille's labyrinth. As we know from the work of Ferranti scholars Tiziana De Rogatis, Catherine Welling Georgi, Leslie Elwell, and myself, Greek mythology belongs to Elena Ferranti's poetics, as her female protagonists enact archaic rituals and rites of passage. Troubling Love rewrites the myth of Demeter and Persephone. The days of abandonment draws on the stories of Medea and Jason, Aeneas and Dido. Leda in The Lost Daughter evokes the myth of Leda and the Swan. And the narrator of the Neapolitan novels bears the unambiguously mythological name of Elena Greco. In Frantumalia, a collection of essays and interviews, Ferranti herself admits, time and again, the formative influence of Greek myth on her creative process. Quote, I returned to Naples for several months. I had my own problems. I retraced many of the roots of my childhood, including the one I had taken with my sister in the rain. I recall the image of the labyrinth as an ordinary space, a known place that, with oneself, is suddenly disrupted by a strong emotion. I got some books, including that vast, captivating hodgepodge that is Graves' The Greek Myths. I wanted to see if the myth would help me describe, by giving me distance, a story of intolerance, love, flight, and abandonment." End of quote. This passage articulates the idea of Naples itself as a labyrinth, a recurring idea in Ferrante's imaginary. But it also names the nexus or overlap between retracing the roots of childhood, mythology, and narrative. This passage anticipates Elena and Lila's own walking through the labyrinth of the Rione and Don Achilles building. Indeed, following the prologue, the narrative proper of my brilliant friend opens with Lila and Elena walking up the dark stairs to Don Aquila's top floor apartment. Quote, my friendship with Lila began the day we decided to go up the dark stairs that led step after step, flight after flight, to the door of Don Aquila's apartment. The arduous process of advancing towards a terrifying goal transpires within the liminal space of the dark entryway the unlit staircase, the murky landings. It is a descent into the underworld where a monstrous beast awaits the two girls. Elena continues to describe the horrifying progress, sketching a portrait of Don Achille. And this is the second quote. I was frozen with fear. Don Achille was the ogre of fairy tales. I was absolutely forbidden to go near him. He was a being created out of some unidentified material. I was trembling. Every footfall, every voice was Don Achille creeping up behind us or coming down toward us with a long knife. Maria, Don Achille's wife, would put me in the pan of boiling oil. The children would eat me. He would suck my head the way my father did with mullets. We stopped often, and each time I hoped that Lila would decide to turn back. I was all sweaty. Thus, from the very beginning, Don Achille becomes a fairy tale monster, a child devouring minotaur at the center of a dark and dreadful space. Robert Graves' Greek myths recounts the myth of Theseus and the minotaur. The queen of Crete, Pasiphae, fell in love with the white bull. The illicit passion was the punishment the gods inflicted on King, King Minos for his own transgressions. The Minotaur, half bull, half human, was born out of the union of Pasiphae and the white bull. To conceal the shame of such monstrous offspring inflicted on him as punishment, the king of Crete closed him in the labyrinth, a prison constructed by the architect Daedalus. King Minos fed this anthropophagus beast with seven young women and seven young men sent every nine years by Athens. 
until Theseus, the son of the Athenian king, killed the Minotaur with the help of Ariadne, the daughter of Minos. Ariadne fell in love with Theseus, and to save him from certain death in the labyrinth, she gave him a thread. The thread, tied to the labyrinth's entrance, first guided him through the labyrinth and then helped him find the exit. In the myth, the labyrinth becomes the architectonic symbol of feminine desire and transgression, Pasiphae's forbidden lust for the white bull, which must be punished and contained. Classic scholar Paul Allen Miller has shown that in fact in the Aeneid, another important influence on Ferrante's poetics, Virgil's image of the labyrinth serve as a, serves as a warning against women's uncontainable desire. Miller argues that the labyrinth embodies the male symbolic order whose role is to suppress, control, and guard against the monstrous. And here I quote Paul Allen Miller. From this point of view, the labyrinth would be analogous to the symbolic itself, the social realm of language and ideology whose role is to subsume and contain the monsters of the imaginary. The labyrinth is the symbolic functions as a mechanism of repression, which makes a controlled, socially sanctioned desire possible. At the beginning of book six of the Aeneid, the labyrinth is depicted as a rational structure built to contain the Minotaur, a monstrous offspring created from the blending of female and animal passion. It simultaneously holds within itself that which is dangerous to let out and keeps out those who would try to probe too deeply within and fall prey to monsters better left undisturbed." End of quote. The labyrinth then is an, is an, an architectonic mechanism for control and enforcing conformity, an architectural warning against feminine excess and transgression. It is synonymous with the male-dominated space and patriarchal order of the Rione. It is a symbol of the city, which, as Elizabeth Gross reminds us, produces and circulates power as it produces and circulates acceptable and appropriate forms of the body. To connect further the labyrinth described by both Robert Graves and Virgil to the Neapolitan setting of my brilliant friend, it must be noted that the Aeneid is an important intertext in Ferrante's works, but specifically in the first volume of the Neapolitan novels. Virgil describes the myth of the Minotaur in the sixth book of the Aeneid. Aeneas, who has just arrived in Italy, is in fact at Cuma, the ancient Greek colony which founded Neapolis or Naples. In Apollo's temple, built by none other than Daedalus, Aeneas sees depicted the story of the Minotaur, Pasiphae's lust for the bull, the labyrinth designed to contain their offspring, and Daedalus himself, who guides Ariadne's steps with a thread. The image of the Minotaur in the labyrinth is then located textually, mythologically, within the territory of Naples as a literary and topographic link between the labyrinth and the city. We can understand the opening of My Brilliant Friend in which two girls walk step by step and flight by flight through a dark, terrifying space as an evocation of the labyrinth as both the patriarchal order of their neighborhood and the powerful presence awaiting them at the end of their journey, the Minotaur Don Achille. From the first page of My Brilliant Friend, then, Ferrante maps the salient features of the myth of the Minotaur. Don Achille is the man-devouring beast, the two girls making they, their way through this dark building, frozen with fear, sweating, but following, as it were, an Ariadne thread of their own. The ancient myth, the archaic world of women punished for their desires, erupts from within the mundane reality of the Rione, as Lila and Elena dare to probe deeply within it, to use Paul Miller's phrasing, and are exposed to the monsters within. In fact, just a few pages into the novel, Elena describes how she and Lila play with their dolls, placing them deliberately next to the windows of a building cellar, next to the cellar's grating, challenging the darkness inside and each other. The basement is to them the realm of Don Achille. Quote, Don Achille, for example, was not only in his apartment on the top floor, but also down below, a spider among spiders, a rat among rats, a shape that assumed all shapes." End of quote. 
So when Leela pushes Elena's doll through the grating into the cellar, and in a specular gesture, Elena throws Leela's doll as well, the two girls must descend into the labyrinth to retrieve their dolls. Leela and Elena's ordeal inside the labyrinth lasts for more than 60 pages. In fact, it constitutes the entire first part of the volume, which I remind you is titled Childhood, the Story of Don Achille, and thus defines the story of their childhood and their friendship. The narrative does not progress in a linear manner. It shifts back and forth as Leela and Elena proceed up the stairs and pause at the landings, plummeting down to the basement where they go first, then culminating in their ascent to the top floor and the encounter with Don Achille. Ferrante's mode of narrating follows the pace of Leela and Elena's journey up and down the stairs. The plot emerges from spatial coordinates and bodily movement. The figure of the Minotaur, Don Achille, appears first in the underworld of the building's basement, where Leela and Elena search in vain for their dolls. There, among the dark masses of objects in the cellar, Leela finds an anti-gas mask and puts it on in a defiant gesture. And here I quote, she had put the face with the glass eyes over hers, and now her face was enormous, with round, empty eye sockets and no mouth, only that protruding black chin swinging over her chest. This image renders Leela less human and more beast-like, evoking the bull-headed, human-bodied minotaur. On the next page, Elena confirms Don Achilles' presence underneath the buildings as she imagines what has happened to their dolls, Tina and Nu, the Minotaur's first victims. Quote, the shapeless mass of Don Achille running through the underground tunnels, arms dangling, large fingers grasping Nu's head in one hand and in the other, Tina's. I suffered terribly. Notably, for Elena and Lila, Don Achille is not only the beast in the labyrinth, but he's also simultaneously beneath and above, inside and outside, a spatial metaphor for the pervasiveness of male power and control. Beginning with the descent into the basement and the search for the dolls, Elena feels physically oppressed by the Rione with its spatial and symbolic constraints. She becomes painfully aware of her neighborhood as prison, an architectonic trap. <clears throat> Quote, when I returned to the streets and to school, I felt that the space too had changed. It seemed to be chained between two dark poles. On one side was the underground air bubble that pressed on the roots of the houses, the threatening cavern the dolls had fallen into. On the other, the upper sphere, on the fourth floor of the building where Don Achille, who had stolen them, lived. The two balls were as if screwed to the end of an iron bar, in which, which in my imagination obliquely crossed the apartments, the streets, the countryside, the tunnel, the railroad tracks, and compressed them. I felt squeezed in that vise. This passage outlines the parameters of the labyrinth of Elena and Lila's childhood, the Rione as the imposition of patriarchal logic, physical violence, and pervasive fear. Don Achilles seems only the symptom of a larger condition, one that manifests spatially for Elena, who feels squeezed by the weight of the neighborhood, the weight of the male city. The space underground, the basement, reaches out and above to the top floor and spreads out to enclose the whole neighborhood, abolishing the boundary between below and above, inside and outside, vertical and horizontal, myth and modernity. The Rione in Ferrante's novel instills, enacts, and ensures the subjugation of the feminine body and mind. In an interview with Luisa Moraro, Ferrante comments precisely on this gendered structure of Naples. She describes Naples as a male-governed space where men, quote, crush and torture women, where women feel the weight of the male city on their existent, existence, silent victims to it, end of quote. We see the violence of the city in Elena and Lila's childhood when the two girls who have internalized their parents' fear, silence, and conformity attribute the disappearance of their dolls to the most feared person in the neighborhood, Don Achille. But instead of turning back, they enter the labyrinth, first the underground of the basement, then the dark doorway and the stairs of Don Achille's building, and proceed upwards to liberate their dolls from the monster. 
Their walk through the labyrinth, in fact, generates their friendship, becomes the moment which binds them forever, and thus generates the narrative itself, the story of Elena and Lila that spans the four volumes of the Neapolitan novels. We know from the first chapter of My Brilliant Friend that their friendship begins the moment Lila takes Elena's hand on the stairs to Don Aquila's apartment. Quote, we climbed slowly toward the greatest of our terrors of that time. We went to expose ourselves to fear and interrogate it. At the fourth flight, Lila had did something unexpected. She stopped to wait for me, and when I reached her, she gave me her hand. This gesture changed everything between us forever. This is the novel's self-reflexive -re moment of Genesis, creation reconfigured as feminine. This gesture is, of course, made possible only through the girls traversing of the labyrinth, their joining forces, hands, against the Minotaur. Almost 40 pages later, Elena returns to the climactic scene of their childhood to finally narrate its resolution. Uh, sorry, that's the second quote. So we climbed the stairs. At every step, I was on the point of turning around and going back to the courtyard. I still feel Lila's hand grasping mine. So one beside the other, I on the wall side and she on the banister side, sweaty palms clasped, we climbed the last flights. At Don Aquila's door, my heart was pounding. I could hear it in my ears, but I was consoled by thinking that it was also the sound of Lila's heart. The image of their sweaty hands clasped together reiterates the gesture that initiated the narrative. The more they climb the stairs and the farther they reach into the labyrinth, the closer they become. Not only their hands, but their bodies become one. Elena's heart beating is the sound of Lila's heart. This merging of sweaty hands and pounding hearts lies at the beginning of the long journey of Lila and, and Elena's lives. It forms the narrative thread that weaves the fabric of the story and Elena Ferrante conceives of writing, of storytelling as the art of weaving, the plot of the Neapolitan novels. The sweat literally seals the pact of friendship between the two girls, a pact founded literally upon the bodily fluids, and that's another important Ferrante image, of these two little women. Here, of course, I refer to the outcome of the con confrontation with Don Achille who gives Elena and Lila money to buy new dolls. With the money, they buy a book and read it obsessively for months, side by side, sitting in the courtyard of their games. It is Louisa Alcott's Little Women. And the pact of friendship is transformed into a pact of readers and writers, creators and collaborators, who plot to write a book. When Lila does write a book, The Blue Fairy, Elena discovers her friend's talent for storytelling, and from that point on, Elena models her own writing on Lila's, competing with her friend, but also drawing on her literary genius for her own creative work. Even the very tetralogy, Elena's long narrative about her friend, exists in competition with, or thanks to, the novel Elena imagines Lila, Lila could have written. As Rebecca Falkoff writes, Quote, the Neapolitan novels, according to their fiction, are only a shadowy approximation of the work of Lila's genius. End of quote. The genesis of Lila and Elena's creative collaboration of the tetralogy itself must be situated at the moment their sweaty palms touch and they climb together the dark staircase. But to go back to the mythological layer underlying the scene, if Don Achille is figured as the monster Minotaur, then where are Theseus and Ariadne? The gesture of the two clasped and sweaty hands weaves a pattern, a bond, a magic thread, which allows Elena and Lila to find their way in the labyrinth and then out of it. The thread that connects the met and metaphorically stitches together the lives of the two friends is in fact Ariadne's thread, the very narrative thread that runs throughout the tetralogy and holds it together as the story of Lila and Elena's friendship. Therefore, from the image of Lila and Elena, two little women walking together and unified by hands and pounding hearts, emerges a double Ariadne. Theseus, the powerful Athenian hero, has been replaced by a feminine couple. 
This new configuration subverts the symbolic order of the labyrinth and the rione and enacts a new system, a new movement through space produced by two women. The metaphorical thread which unites Elena and Lila from the moment in which they join hands runs throughout their lives, transformed into a long creative collaboration between women whose literary voices and narrative styles become intertwined into Elena's writing and ultimately produce the very text of the novels we're reading. In other words, the physical and metaphorical bond between Lila and Elena, the two brilliant friends, constitutes Ariadne's thread. The image of Ariadne plays an important role in Ferrante's literary imagination and creative process. In an essay titled Cities, she discusses her literary sources and influences, linking them to the representation of Naples in her own works, mapping the relationship between feminine bodies and cities. She recounts her fascination with the myth of Theseus and Ariadne, and particularly with the variant of the myth in which Theseus abandons the pregnant Ariadne on an island. While in Naples, Ferrante works on an Ariadne story of her own, set on the Amalfi Coast, about, quote, a city of female friendship and solidarity, but free in its thoughts and in its conflicts. I imagined a community of modern women writing consoling love letters to a modern Ariadne, collaborating in a true harmonious project." End of quote. But Ferrante's creative process stalls as she comes to the realization that, quote, even in the case of cities dominated by women, one can and must write only of city labyrinths, the repositories of our complex and contradictory emotions, where the beast is lying in ambush and it's dangerous to get lost without having first learned to do so. This reflection on the literary creation of a feminine city can be seen as anticipating the building labyrinth of the beast Don Achille. Elena and Lila become lost in the labyrinth precisely in order to learn how to find their way within the male city, inside a male-dominated urban space and social order, how to unfurl and deploy the magic thread which unites them as friends, collaborators, and co-creators. In the same essay, Ferrante continues to elaborate on the connection between women and cities. She reflects on the mythological figure of Dido, depicted in the Aeneid, whose sheer genius helps her found a new city, transforming a male-issued condition into a condition for feminine creativity and skill. Dido, fleeing from Tyre, seeks refuge in northern Africa. The local king tells her that she can have as much land as the hide of a bull. Then Dido cuts and sews the hide all night, and here I quote Ferrante, reducing it to almost invisible strips, which were then sewed together in such a way that the seams couldn't even be guessed at. A very long Ariadne's thread, a ball of animal skin which would unroll to enclose a vast piece of African land and, at the same time, the boundaries of a new city. End of quote. Strikingly, here Ferrante weaves together the image of the bull, the Minotaur, Ariadne's thread, and Dido's city. In Ferrante's telling, Ariadne's thread, the product of skilled feminine hands, unrolls to enfold the land of a feminine city. In the same way, Lila and Elena create their own Ariadne's thread to mark and circumscribe their own space within the male-dominated Rione. The story of Elena and Lila's childhood concludes with the murder of Don Achille, the text thus tying together the two stories, that of Lila and Elena's early friendship and that of Don Achille. Even though Alfredo Peluso is arrested for the murder, the novel, the novel never confirms that he really was the perpetrator. Lila, fascinated with the gory details, keeps imagining the scene of the murder, insisting that it was a woman who killed Don Achille. And I quote here, with great seriousness, always adding new details, she compelled us to hear the story as if she had been present. Surely she imagined that the murderer was female only because it was easier for her to identify with her." End of quote. It is not entirely impossible 
to imagine Leela, the bad, terrible, rebellious Leela, who survives being thrown out of the window as the murderess of the Minotaur Don Achille, of the mythological beast rather than the man. In having Leela narrate the murder of Don Achille at the hands of a woman, Ferrante in effect rewrites the myth of Theseus and the Minotaur. In Ferrante's own version, a double Ariadne enters the labyrinth and defeats the monster. This victorious Ariadne inaugurates Leela and Elena's friendship and thus inaugurates the story of that friendship. This double Ariadne, the woman lost in a city labyrinth, too belongs to Ferrante's urban imaginary. Ferrante recalls a scene from her own childhood, she and her sister getting lost in Naples and running to find their way home. And I quote Ferrante, I had to stop tug on my sister so that she wouldn't run away, grasp the thread of orientation, which is a magic thread, to tie one street to the next, making tight knots, so that the streets would calmly settle down and I could find the way home." End of quote. In this passage, Ferrante brings together Ariadne's and Dido's threads into a single thread which conquers disorientation and in doing so molds and marks the territory of a feminine city. And in this image, we see the precursor of Elena and Lila who conquer their fear and find their way in the Minotaur's labyrinth, twisting and unfurling the magic thread woven by the sweat of their hands. And of course, it is not by chance that in the second part of my brilliant friend, Adolescence, Lila becomes a passionate reader of Virgil's Aeneid and Elena writes an essay on Dido's feminine city, developing the ideas of her friend, producing a text that's doubly authored. Ferrante, discussing Walter Benjamin's Berlin childhood, declares that, quote, there is not a city labyrinth, therefore, without a pacifier who gives birth to the beast Minotaur, without an Ariadne in love, end of quote. The origins of the labyrinth for Ferrante are always doubly feminine. The first volume of the Neapolitan novels posits a feminine couple at the center of the labyrinth, Lila and Elena, who cross the labyrinth, defeat the Minotaur, and find their way out, making their own Ariadne's thread, molding the space of the building according to their bodies and desires, delineating the territory of their own feminine labyrinth at the heart of the, of the male-dominated urban topography. But above all, the journey through the labyrinth inaugurates their new feminine identity, not entirely contingent on the symbolic order, but on the bond between the two of them, a bond or a thread that determines and guides their lives in the Neapolitan novels. And so here's a spoiler if you haven't read the first volume. Uh, this is my last paragraph, and it tells how the four volumes conclude. So I apologize, but it's crucial to my argument. <laughs> Okay, here goes. It is not surprising then that the two dolls, Tina and Nu, appear again at the closing of the narrative frame in the fourth volume as a last sign from Lila, who announces her presence by sending Elena the two dolls 60 years after their disappearance in the basement. Perhaps it was Lila who had the two dolls all along. And perhaps it was Leela who orchestrated the walk in the labyrinth in enc the encounter with the Minotaur. But why? Perhaps to appropriate the literal and symbolic architecture of the neighborhood and to reconfigure it from within, to change its dynamics from an androcentric locus of power to a feminine city labyrinth of women's creative power, the city of Ariadne and Dido, Leela and Elena. Thank you. So I don't know what's the format now. Well, um, would you be willing to answer some questions for the Yes, I'm happy to. Yes, please. So I'm so thrilled. It was beautiful. It was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. But in addition to that, I was so thrilled that you came to that last image of the dolls. I was obsessed with, you know. And also, I think it's so mysterious as to 
the po where are those dolls when they go down into the basement, and how does Leela manage to conceal them, etc. You know, but okay, we're gonna we're gonna go with that suspension of disbelief. But of course, who is she using this recreation of feminine power on? But her dear friend, mm -hmm. you know. So I I mean, we know that they're that the author is obsessed with the double yeah. and the merging of identity. And I, I mean, and obviously there's just a complex relationship between them, but if you could just talk about that question of why she does use it against Linu, in effect. Why by, having hi by having hidden those dolls all along and then revealing them at the end mm -hmm. and saying, I've had them all along. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's one way of reading it, of okay. course. Yes. Um, but, no, but please reframe it. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's, it's a great question. I think on the one hand, it's, it's a way in which Leela maintains control, which she has always been doing. And so I think in, in an Italian version of this paper, I claim that Leela is the minotaur, that she appropriates the labyrinth and the minotaur, the power at the center of it. So the mask, the gas mask, and the way that she poses as, as a beast, as an animal, recalls, of course, the, the bull-headed bull man. And so I think, in a way, she is appropriating the power of the minotaur and stands at the center and claims that power at the end. And she manifests it. And so I think it is just her um, attempt to, to show, to demonstrate her control of the situation, that she's still there. And even without a body, because she has erased every trace of her existence, even without a body, she still has that power. So she has, in a sense, I think she appropriates the city of Naples, because that's also what Elena fears that Lilo is doing. She's writing the great Neapolitan novel, which will revive, resuscitate the city and become its, its full manifestation and so I think she also now she's dissolved in the city and she becomes part of the city she is the power that emanates from the city so then the city it becomes truly feminine and so maybe these are different ways in which you can read the ending that on the one hand she's the minotaur on the other hand the minotaur the power that the minotaur embodies the male power has been dissolved has been you know to think of the dissolving margins that Leela has be, has dissolved into the city and become one with the city. So this is truly a feminine city. Okay, okay there's another question. I feel like I'm in the classroom yeah, again. This is my students. Inappropriate, yeah. yeah. Um, well, if you talk about the duplication, you were talking about the feminine coupling. Um, so, I mean, in, in terms of that, you're talking about Pazifae and Ariadne. And I mean, do you, do you think of that as like kind of a more vague narrative just in terms of, of a rep representing the duplication? And obviously there's duplication throughout all Ferrante's novels. Or do you feel that in their growing up and in their falling in love, because there is love in both of their timelines, whether they resemble like the, those, those actual narratives of, I mean, Theseus, the, the ending of that myth is also that Theseus leaves Ariadne alone. He claims that he's going to run away with her and he leaves her on her own on an island where she's never come from. And so, yeah, I was wondering if you, th if you could speak a little, if you think that duplicates more so for it's more just kind of the idea of that duplication. Thank you, actually, you uh, made me think about uh, the Minotaur and desire and, and, the, and the labyrinth as a way to suppress, control, contain feminine desire, but it's, but what's really interesting in the myth is that it's King Minos who is punished for his own transgressions against Poseidon. So he's the one at fault. And so in order to punish him, Poseidon sends him, sends his wife a punishment so that he, King Minos, has to deal with the shameful offspring of his wife's forbidden lust. So in a sense, I think the Minotaur is, is a scapegoat. It's the expiation of of King Minos's own transgression. So Leela, so going back to, I, I'm sorry Lydia, but this is making me think of another question, another way to answer that first question is that, that Leela eliminates that male transgression at the beginning, at the origin of the, the myth of the Minotaur and makes it all about women, women's desire, and women who retain control over their actions and their deeds. And so that is a manifestation of Leela's desire at the end too. So then men, I think that then they're kind of the love interests. Men are not particularly uh, favorably de depicted in <laughs> Elena Ferrante's novels. We were talking with Rebecca earlier about, about how their bodies are, 
these baggy monsters, that they are the real monsters. And, 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 and we see Don Achille. And so I think in a way, Nino is one of those monsters for sure. We have the violent fathers, we have in all of her texts, we have the monster, the man, the monster at the heart of, of women suffering and oppression. So I think they, they, and perhaps they seem destined to repeat that fate, that um, to, to tie themselves to, to the man monster, Nino for one, and Lila on the other hand, again, by raising herself, by disappearing, can release herself from that cycle, vicious cycle of, of repetition, of illicit passion, falling for the man monster. But doesn't she sort of become the man monster in a sense, herself with her trickery against her friend? She is aggressing against her friend. Yeah, I mean, I mean, but yes, she does. But it is a woman monster. Yes. <laughs> Which is nothing new. I mean, women. Yes. I, she is appropriating. I think to me, I read her as appropriating the myth and becoming the Minotaur. So appropriating the the, the power of, of mythological narrative. Yes. Hi, thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed your talk. When you were speaking about the female city, I was reminded of Fabrizio Ramondino's mm -hmm. novel, uh, Athenopis, and I was just wondering if you saw any reflections of that novel, because in that, in that wonderful epic tale of multi-generational women telling their stories, if if you think in some ways Ferrante may be recalling that. Yeah, perhaps in her earlier text. Yeah, I mean, definitely women, the, um, yes, the relationship with the mother. Yes, I think there are many, I mean, it could be one of the intertexts to Ferrante's works in general. I think Ferrante is definitely, is often identifying her sources. And I've never in, encountered a reference to Ramundino's work. So this would be interesting to look into. Thank you. Hi, uh, me being male, I'm from Naples. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I, I feel like I need to uh, clarify something. Uh, there, is, <laughs> there, is, there, is, um, there is an element uh, in, in the book that uh, is, I mean, you can't, um, how you say, um, overlook, which is uh, the period that the story is set which is like after the, the Second World War I mean, and beyond. But uh, it was a period in which uh, poverty was um, also conducting, like was, was, was leading the behavior of people. And the violence of the, um, of the city in that period was just as, um, as much as the violence in other cities in Italy during that period. That was, like I said, uh, especially in the su southern Italy. Um, I was wondering because I mean it's true that the characters, that the male characters of the book are um, horrible, are like are very very hard to um, to bear, you know, like so violent and so vicious, and but also the female characters that are not the protagonists mm -hmm. um, are, are are somehow a reflection of that period and a reflection of that. Uh, Way of being, uh, like for example, the mother of the of the protagonist, and um, also the the teacher, who's so hard on uh, Lila, you know. So I wanted to, I wanted your uh, opinion about uh, those female characters and uh, why they were also so um, sometimes so hard on on the girls, you know, on, on in the, in the book in the in the first book. Mm -hmm. She's the one I read. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. That's. I mean, absolutely. We shouldn't ignore the political context that this is a post World War II narrative, but also it's set in the fifth, late fifties, sixties with the economic boom in Italy. These are important contexts. Absolutely. But in the first volume in particular, the narrative lens is that of a six to you know fourteen year old child. So I think it is a child. And and Elena herself talks about the way children perceive time. She does not talk about 
historical context, politics, none of this really enters her discourse. It is all removed through the lens of childhood, of timelessness, of kind of outside, being outside, outside of, of Kronos. It's a moment in the present, it's a Kairos. And so I think we need to keep that in mind, that she is completely outside of this political frame of reference, at least in the first volume, that she is narrating the story through the eyes of a, let's say, six-year-old at the beginning. And so you asked me, so I think this, this, in a way, I think helps mitigate some of the, of my comments. So this is, it's a narrative about mythology, it's about narrative kind of tropes, it's about kind of archa archaic paradigms and rites of passage as perceived by a girl, by a little girl. But you asked about the teachers, the mother and then Maestro Oliviero. Uh, so there, I think the mother is, of course, a double for Elena, that, a negative double, a foil, that which she does not want to become. She has a limp and she's cross-eyed, and Lila's remedy for that, sorry, excuse me, Elena's remedy for that is to become friends for, with Lila. And she says, the only way I would not become my mother is to become friends with Lila, to follow her every step of, her, of the way. And so in a way, this is, the mother is what Elena could have become had she not followed Lila. And Lila is the salvation, Lila is the model. She is the way out of that situation. Uh, with the teacher, I think it's, it's, it's similar. The teacher sees the literal, uh, Lila's mother is illiterate, for example, and there's an embarrassing episode when Lila's mother cannot read what's written on the board. And so I think the teacher is the same. This is, these are the two, the two opposite ends. There is the illiterate mother, the plebs, what she called la plebe, the plebs, and then there is Elena who is ambitious and who has drive and wants to, to exit. And so I think the maestro is the one who sees both, kind of has an insight into both ends of how Elena could, could end up. So I don't know if I'm, if I'm answering your question. To, in reaction to the gentleman's question and your answer, I mean, I think he was saying too that the, the women grew up, you know, very harsh, violent people. And I mean, as children, young children growing up in that environment, it's almost like they had to. You know, they, they learn the world is harsh, the world mm -hmm. is difficult, and you have to be strong and you have to fight back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, of that course they became that way because yes. it was the world they, you mm -hmm. know, they had to survive in. Yeah, right? and yeah. they, but they portrayed as the norm, right? I mean, it's not even something they had to learn. It was yeah. by default, it was, it was of, there. It was right. the way of, exactly. Way of yeah, thank you, that's a, yeah, yeah. great point. Uh, do you have any comment on how the um, the TV series interpreted the novel? Um, that's my question. <laughs> do you want uh, just any comment? <laughs> well, I deliberately did not use stills from the TV show as illustrations for my talk because I wanted to divorce the two. I enjoy the TV series. I showed it in my class. I think it's a faithful, literal adaptation as much as an adaptation can ever be um, faithful or literal, but, but it works well. I think it, there is a way in which it's, it's much more staged. It's much less visceral and it's, it's aestheticized in a way that we don't see in Ferrante's texts. But it works, and I think it works for an American audience. <laughs> there is a comment in front. Yeah, no, I was just going to comment in response to that, just because I was I'm in, in Stiliana's class on Elena Ferrante, and we discussed quite extensively, actually, the parallels between the book and the, the TV series. And the thing is, the, the main critique that has been brought up yeah, the main critique that's been brought up is that 
uh, a lot of times when you put a lot of money into like a, a TV production, you end up with these images of poverty that are really glossy and really beautiful in a way that fetishizes poverty for one, obviously, but it also divorces the reality of the situation. And when you read Ferrante, I'm, I'm not necessarily a fan of almost any dramatization of Ferrante's works because it's so, her works are so arresting. And when you read them in text, they're so, so arresting. And to have no visual to accompany those is almost necessary. That's my only thought. Yeah, if for my favorite adaptation is Troubling Love, the film, Mario Martone's film. I think it's superb. It's, it's a fabulous, phenomenally well done adaptation of her first novel, Troubling Love. The Days of Abandonment is not a, it's, it's a very liberal adaptation. There are many changes, but it's not, it's. It's also, but the woman comes out. Yes, yes, definitely. And it's a film about the city too, so it's about Torino. Any, uh, okay, yes, there's more questions there. Sorry, just one. Uh, I wanted to probe, thank you so much, first of all, this was a terrifically interesting talk. Um, I wanted to probe a little bit further and ask you to speak about, you, you began to make the point, or you're, you were making the point that um, Don Achilles, when he gives them money, they buy Little Women and they begin to read it until it falls apart. And it strikes me that there's this really interesting parallel between um, uh, weaving and writing mm -hmm. that's that's mm -hmm. present. And I wondered if you might expand a little bit more about that. Of course, there's Ariadne's thread that leads them into the labyrinth, and then their friendship kind of leads them back out. But of course, what really leads at least Elena out is her writing. Um, so I, I wondered if you could expand on that. It's, um, it's the master trope in Ferrante for storytelling. I mean, if you think of the first text, the mother's the seamstress in Frantumalia, the mother's seamstress. So telling stories with bodies and with fabrics is what mothers do in Ferrante's world. world. And so then the daughters also do tell stories in a different way. But it is from the very first letter of Frantumalia, the gift of the Befana, Ferrante says that if applies this metaphor of weaving to writing. And she says, if the book has a thread to, Lydia, help me, to weave, to thread something, oh, then it's yeah, going to be. If the book has a thread to weave at to, all, then, it, then, like, then it's done. It's done its so it is, I mean, it's there, thank you. So it's there, it's weaving, is storytelling, it's narrative. And so the, in each of her novels, the, the metaphor appears. Even in Troubling Love, The Days of Abandonment, I can't recall right now, and, in The Lost Daughter, but it's also everywhere in, in My Brilliant Friend. And at some point, Lila, when she, has, when she narrates, when she recounts the, her experience of smarginatura, dissolving boundaries, she says, I cannot weave that fabric. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is what cannot be woven is that experience, that the, she cannot tell, she cannot narrate smarginatura. So that's when weaving fails as a metaphor and actually as, as a way of visualizing or creating something. So this could be something to interrogate further. When does weaving fail in Ferrante's world? Well, I just wanted to say one thing about the television production that it was, it was I thought it was excellent, but the uh, recreation, the set of Naples was so phony. Yeah. And then when, when they get to Ischia, it was so, it was Ischia, so it was such a, a, a difference, you know, a yes. tremendous difference. And that bothered me, the, the streets of, what I wanted to ask is, I know we're just talking about the first volume, but you did mention the end. And what do you say about, about um, Elena's enormous um, involvement and, and also Leela's enormous involvement with the politics that happened, the mafia, and then the entire uh, uh, enormous political uh, fights between the people in Naples, but also you know in the government of that sort, which happened in the second and third, certainly in this very mm -hmm. strongly in the second and third volumes. Well, the miniature doesn't seem to come in there. I mean, oh, and uh, quite on the contrary. I mean, she gets involved with the ma with male power, with the city run by male power, right? And so she enters. She enters something that's supposedly beyond her her purview. And so I think, in a way, that she then she appropriates what that which could be considered a construed male power, the power of the city to regulate human behavior, crime, 
you name it. And so she does, I think, dare to enter, appropriate, reconfigure male power from within, but she's punished. And this is the Minotaur story again, or rather the story of, of King Minos being punished for his wife's, of uh, his wife being punished for King Minos' transgression because Lila gets punished. It's Lila's daughter who gets kidnapped or disappears. So Elena, I think by proxy or vicariously, is punished for usurping male power, for becoming kind of a King Minos figure. And so I think this is, uh, this is how I would connect it to the Minotaur. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.